Jay and Shelly and Nina, and of course, Kathy, thank you again for your willingness to participate in this event. Kathy, thank you for your remarks. Um, I did ask Kathy, I said, you know, don't be a boring college president. I said, uh, be, be provocative, you know, and so she certainly did that. Um, but I hope you saw that some of the ideas that she challenged us with today are, are not ones that are just simply plucked from, from uh, you know, the sky. They really are, many of them, uh, data-driven and research-driven, and um, it's fun as scholars uh, and as practitioners to begin thinking about what some of that uh, new future might look like. So I've got a series of questions that I just will uh, engage our, uh, our panelists on, and we'll try to get through as many of these as we possibly can uh, through our time. But my first question is really just uh, to react to some of Kathy's uh, remarks. Um, certainly we don't have time for each of you to react to every point she made, but what were some of the more profound things that she said, um, things that maybe you agreed with, or maybe things that you have more questions about? Jay, we'll start with you, and then we'll work down the way. Well, first of all, let me uh, thank, thank you for the rather provocative presentation. You know, I was struck by the fact that I really think the data and the conclusions are unassailable. I think actually the stakes are even higher and are becoming higher as we live in an information-based um, global economy. Well, what strikes me, and I live in a political world, not an academic world, is um, why as a political entity, and this is really a question for all of us and it's meant to be rhetorical, why do we seem to be unwilling to make the kind of investments that will follow the research? Uh, in higher ed, we have disinvested in at least public education in the state of Washington dramatically. And in K-12, it has taken a lawsuit to force the legislature to meet the constitutional requirement of funding basic education. And there are huge debates in the legislature about what that means uh, that fall on political lines in terms of how much money to put at the problem. And fundamentally, to do that without raising taxes. But if the data is true and the stakes are high and it affects the economy of Washington as well as the equity of our students and even our democracy if we are split into the haves and the have-nots, why as a community are we unwilling to tax ourselves and invest to deal with this issue? Um, what really resonated with me and I found very provoking was the whole idea of human capital development. Um, I think in education we get stuck with hiring the same sorts of skill sets and it's not getting us where we need to go in education. Um, in the article that was mentioned it talked about how we have all these reforms but little change. And uh, I do think bold change is really needed to help our students compete in this world. And so I, th that really resonated with me. I have six high level positions posted right now and um, it's very difficult to find the pools that we need desperately to move education forward. So that really resonated with me. I'd love to have our logo up there with the Fortune 300, so I'm going to do some research into that, uh, what Denver Public Schools and the others are looking into. Thank you. Nina? Yeah, well, um, I really appreciated the recognition you gave to the role of early learning in education. Um, and I want to pick up on what Jay said because I couldn't agree with him more, um, and it becomes even more stark when you think about the fact that we know through uh, research and science that the greatest brain development happens in the first three years of life. And the discrepancies that you talked about that show up at age six in terms of uh, children from less fortunate circumstances being less ready for school, the research actually shows that we're starting to see differences in children as early as nine months of age. So um, the, the first three years of life, which is a time when I think a lot of people don't think about education. They think that's the parent's job, that's not education, but learning starts at birth and parents are the most important teachers to their children, their first and most important teachers. So, um, and yet, as Jay said, why are we not investing in that? We're investing less than 1% of our state education dollars in early learning in the state. So um, something is wrong with this picture. <laughs> you put your finger on it. Well, let's stick with our early learning for just a moment since, since we're there. Kathy, what are some of the more innovative um, things that you're seeing in the early learning field across states? Um, 
uh, localities. Uh, what are some of the bolder and more courageous things that you're seeing out there that address the early learning problem? Well, there, there are some schools in, in almost every district that um, are starting really early. Oftentimes they have uh, nonprofit dollars that are helping them. So there was one school that I saw in New York City where they actually started recruiting uh, pregnant women and um, uh, helping pregnant women think about uh, how to support their child's development in utero. Mm -hmm. And then um, they had early Head Start programs, Head Start programs, wraparound services. Um, but the, you know, this is very expensive to do. But uh, it, it was, uh, it's called a community school, so community schools tend to have a lot of wraparound services um, associated with them. And um, there was even um, uh, evening workshops for parents on parenting. I mean, I, we ha I didn't talk about this in my talk, uh, but it's, it's maybe a good time to talk about the importance of partnerships with parents because parents are a child's first teacher, right? And um, we could, I think, leverage parents to uh, in a better way than we do um, in order to support the kinds of educational goals that we have for children. But we have to work with parents. We need to, believe it or not, do things like um, help parents learn how to read a book and how to ask the right kinds of questions and uh, what's age appropriate, what's not age appropriate. Um, you know, some of the uh, behaviors that young children engage in uh, are actually developmentally appropriate and parents don't see them that way. They might see them as misbehaving. We, we, so we need to help parents with all of that. But you, see, you, know, you do see these kinds of schools and I, I think you do when, when you look at a school that really starts early, you, you, you see results for all children including poor kids. Say just a little bit about what's going on in our state right now uh, with our early learning plan, some of the opportunities that we have that Thrive's involved in, and then what some of our biggest challenges are. Yeah, well, um, Kathleen just touched on home visiting as, a, as, as an important service, and our state is uh, greatly expanding home visiting right now. Thrive by Five, my organization, um, administers what's called the Home Visiting Services Account for the state, and we have um, greatly increased the number of children that are getting this important service. Basically a service where a trained professional comes into the home, starting prenatally often, and working with the parent as kind of a coach um, to make sure that they're hearing words, they're being read to, they're you know, developing, they're getting their health taken care of. Because in our state, we realize that it's all connected and that uh, a healthy child uh, is a child who's more ready to learn. So uh, we need to think about health, mental health, social emotional development. We need to think about parents. We need to think about schools and schools being ready for kids as well as kids being ready for school. So that's one thing. Another thing is uh, we are implementing a program called Early Achievers in our state. And that is a quality rating and improvement system. So um, Kathleen mentioned high quality childcare. A lot of children spend time in childcare in our state and most of it is not high quality. Um, so this is a program that measures quality. So for the first time we'll be able to really measure the quality of our childcare programs and then also provides opportunities um, through training and professional development and coaching for these programs to get better. And then finally, one thing I want to mention is our kindergarten assessment process called WAKIDS, which we just started in the state about a year or so ago, because um, as a state, we've not really had much data to be able to show what works with these young kids. This now measures how ready for school kids are, and what we're finding, of course, is that the same things you said, low-income kids, kids of, from certain communities of color, um, are not entering school as ready as their white middle-class counterparts. And all kids are entering better in some areas than others, and we've got a big problem with math in particular. Shelley, let's, let's, I'm curious to hear a little bit about your reflections on, on Kathy's remarks around um, teacher assessment and, and accountability. I'm just curious to know what you, how you all are thinking about those issues in the Spokane Public Schools, how you are investing uh, perhaps in professional development, how you're coming alongside teachers um, to develop their professional skills, and then how you're working for transparency and accountability within that system. Sure. Well, I think that they're just trying to be a game changer right now 
now. The whole idea of TPEP, it's called our Teacher Preparation Evaluation System. Um, we're concerned about how it's rolling out, though, that it's going to be another reform that doesn't make a difference. And so we're working very, very hard at the district level, working with our teachers' union, of how can we actually make it make a difference and better prepare our teachers to be able to work with students. Um, a lot of that is how does evaluation fit in with the coaching model? And that was mentioned in Kathy's presentation. And again, what is the difference between evaluation and coaching? And so we're really having those philosophical discussions right now because you actually need both. Um, we need our teachers to have coaches side by side helping them. But also we need to have someone that can objectively evaluate. Uh, we tend to rate all of our teachers high. I think it's because so many people in education don't want to deliver bad news. However, we're hurting so many of our students because we're not helping teachers uh, improve because we have on paper that they're doing just fine when actually they're not. So I think really being honest and having those dialogues uh, with our teachers union is going to be very important. Um, and then having those conversations often will help with the transparency as we move forward. But we really do have to change and be honest when people are struggling. Jay, you serve as a representative of the Higher Education Coordinating Board, which is the replacement of the uh, 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 actually, it's the other way around. The Washington Student Achievement uh, Council, which was the replacement of the Higher Education, help me out, HEC board. Higher Education Coordinating Higher, Board. Higher Education Coordinating Board, thank you. Um, tell, tell us briefly what the work of, of that group has been since it was reformed, and um, uh, where, where the board is currently on some of its recommendations, and what to be kind of looking forward to uh, in the next few months. Well, I think the transition from the Higher Education Coordinating Board to the Student Achievement Council is important because we are not talking about coordinating among higher education institutions. We're really trying to break down the silos, talk more holistically about student achievement from pre-K throughout, and really go towards a goal of student achievement and moving from coordination among siloed organizations to think more systemically is really important philosophical difference. What we have been charged with is to come up with a 10-year plan for achieving a higher student achievement. And um, we've been asked to be bold, but the fact that it's a 10-year plan suggests that uh, we're gonna require some patience, some investment, some measurement, um, I have to say that my experience, we came out with a report in December in which we identified five areas of great uh, attention that's needed. Um, and we've gone on a 10 city tour to listen to superintendents. And it is an incredibly complex and difficult subject. And the more I learn, the more complex it is. We have to come out with a plan, a 10-year plan in December, and it's going to be a daunting challenge because you keep referring to it, and we all do, as an education system, and quite candidly, it is not a system at all. Um, it's a group of very complex entities that are often in competition with one another for resources and students that don't communicate or coordinate. There's no one looking at it holistically. And frankly, a lot of the institutions are trying to get through the next budget cycle or deal with the next reform of the day. There's a lot of fatigue out there and a lot of cynicism. And part of the goal of the Student Achievement Council is to sort of step back, sort of take a deep breath, and talk about how over 10 years we can really make substantive improvements. Tell us a little bit more about your, your, the research you understand about charter schools, your general um, uh, what you're seeing out there in terms of the keys for success for charter schools, because um, I think that's something that's definitely on the minds of a lot of Spokaneites and Was Washington residents. Well, um, you know, the, there, again, there's pretty good research um, from economists that uh, when, when you look at charter schools across the board, and you, you, they, they do not outperform public schools. But when you look at some of the high-performing charter schools, like KIPP is a high-performing charter school. That those kids really do do better. So, um, it's you. You need to think about what you're talking about when you talk about charter schools per se. I like charter schools because I think it offers an avenue for experimentation. Um, one of the worries I have about charter schools, though, is that um, 
uh, typically they hire very young teachers who work very long hours. And so some of the performance you get is really on the back of teachers. And the only reason that's problematic is, is that, again, it calls into question whether or not you could scale this up in any meaningful way. Um, so I will, I will say something somewhat more positive, though. In Boston, we have something called pilot schools. The difference between a pilot school and a charter school is, is, is not meaningful. It basically has to do with the relationship to the district. But um, Again, Tom Kane on my faculty did do an evaluation of the Boston Pilot Schools, and the student performance there is a little bit better. You know, not dramatically, but it is a little bit better, so, so that's encouraging. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't know this, but the panelists know it. I haven't asked them one question yet that I sent them beforehand, so I'm just up here riffing. So I'm going to try to get back on script here a little bit. Um, so on campus today with, with, with Kathy, we had a lot of conversations around the role of technology and online learning in higher education. Um, Kathy serves on the board of edX, which is the Harvard-MIT collaboration. Um, and it is certainly the issue of the day right now in higher education. How will we respond as colleges and universities to this new uh, technology? But certainly K-12 education is also uh, dealing with the Khan Academy is a great example of that kind of innovation. So it seems to me that there's a, a, a challenge in that our education system, both at the K-12 and higher education levels, has to respond to uh, transforming itself uh, from institutions that were in societies where knowledge and information were scarce. Mm -hmm. And part of the education system was in fact to transmit that knowledge and, and information. But now knowledge and information are ubiquitous. So how do institutions, K-12 institutions, how do education systems change the way we view education when knowledge and information are now more ubiquitous than they've ever been, more accessible than they've ever been? We actually contract out with a number of districts on the west side that utilize our curriculum and our programs with blended learning. Um, so I think we're going to see more of that where students are, have a <coughs> real life teacher, but then they also are taking a lot online. There is, for example, right now we have middle school students that don't want to just take one language but multiple and the online allows students to do that they can take Japanese um, maybe online and then Spanish with a face-to-face -face teacher so I think we'll see more of that I do think it's not very far away that each student will have a device and we will really see the demise of textbooks I think that's really near in the future um, I see that it's just such a part of the students I was subbing in Shadel the other day and it's like an appendage you know their their phone and their device and, but I do think we need to, to capture that. They want to engage with that. So having their learning with technology is, is really where this generation is and where we need to go in education. So um, that does take an investment. So we need to look at our money differently, how we spend it. I really think textbooks are on their way out. Are you seeing in Spokane Public Schools uh, uh, some experimentation with flipped classrooms and other kinds of things? And how yes. is that? What, yes. what are the early signs from yeah, those? Very, very positive. We're seeing the flipped classroom. We're seeing the blended learning. Very positive results with some of our most at-risk youth staying engaged and graduating from high school. So really thinking outside the box. But very, very positive preliminary results with that. Nina? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to say that um, Online education is really so important for childcare providers who um, are in the in the field. People work very long hours. Childcare is open till seven, seven thirty at night, um, and they work all day long from seven in the morning or six in the morning, um, and so it's opened up a whole world for um, the early learning providers in our state. And um, I remember this will date me a bit, but I remember when I first started in the field, we had these kits and we would like send them to the provider. They'd fill it out and they'd send it back and that was, you know, distance learning. Um, but now, you know, <laughs> what we have is, you know, so much more sophisticated and so much better. Um, and also, believe it or not, where even the little, little kids are using technology now and um, using the computer to some degree. And, you know, in the field we talk a lot about that's great. And it's so important to develop the soft skills in kids and the, and the uh, relationship skills and the ability to problem solve and interact and regulate emotions and all these kinds of things. And so there's ways in which this can fall short. 
Um, so we need to definitely need to have blended learning, as you say. We definitely have to do both. I mean, I think on the upside, um, one could think about it as leveraging existing resources, faculty resources, and uh, providing access at not significantly greater cost to more people. So uh, that's one thing. Two, the accessibility of people who are working. There are something like 900,000 Washington citizens not in school who have some higher education credits but no degrees. This is an extraordinary way for them to get back into the classroom. And it's scalable. Having said that, um, there's a lot of resistance among faculty who find the magic of the classroom, the traditional multi-central modality of a professor talking to students and the magic that happens when that occurs, being put in jeopardy by this sort of a grandiose vision of we'll just put everybody online and somehow the magic will t still take place. My own sense is it's too early to tell. And what we're encouraging the universities and others to do is to embrace this with great seriousness and see how far we can use it for scalability and reducing, if you will, the cost of the educational product, but try to maintain the essence of education. And I, I, I don't think we know enough yet, but I think we can all predict that in 10 years, the delivery of education will look very, very different. The students will demand something on their machines. The faculty will have to respond, even over their protests, but uh, what, what the end result will be and the quality we don't know. The large online MOOC courses um, have attracted hundreds of thousands of people, but the rate of people actually finishing the courses is under 2% or 3%. So there's a lot of experimentation out there. Because I think Smith and Whitworth are very similar in the sense that we do believe that fundamentally um, there is something more going on than simply knowledge, trans, uh, tra you know, uh, dissemination going on. That uh, through educational, through uh, experiential, residential, relational kinds of education, mentoring, that in fact um, students are developed from 18 to 22 year, year olds, and, and that is an important process that is facilitated often only by human interaction. Action. At the same time, we know that we better start paying attention to the, the ways, as Jay says, some of this information is going to start coming at our students. So what are you thinking about in your early days at Smith? Well, I'm thinking I, I better talk to the faculty before I say anything. Um, wow, she's, she's good already, yeah. <laughs> but um, I'll tell you how I'm thinking about the problem, which is, or the challenge, um, I can imagine a Smith faculty member deciding to flip his or her classroom. So if you teach Introduction to Computer Science, let's say anywhere in the country right now, um, you could use a course that David Mallon at Harvard um, ha has put up on the edX platform. He's an amazing teacher. And you could use, use some or parts of it, or all of it. Uh, so you could flip your classroom entirely, or, or you could just use the lectures that you like. Um, it's going to enable some college campuses to offer more courses than they might have the faculty to offer. So um, it could be that students take independent studies, so to speak, but they're really doing an online course and discussing it um, with the faculty who's sponsoring them. And that's one thing. Um, I, what I think college presidents and provosts can do is provide uh, some resources for the coalition of the willing, you know, the, the faculty who are interested in getting started. Um, you, you can provide some resources for them um, to put to work on putting a course online, and there are going to be platforms that will be uh, free to colleges and universities to do that. Uh, we don't all have to develop the technology in, in order to offer online courses. I know that MIT and Harvard are committed to having that platform be open. And that's really quite remarkable because they've invested a lot in its development. Um, and I, I will, uh, there's one other thing that I'd like to say that more for Harvard as a, prof as a professional school of education. We're hoping to develop some online uh, professional development that would be free. So um, I, was, I was asking some of the education faculty today whether or not they knew about my colleague Richard Elmore's work on instructional rounds, which is a um, it's, it's a book really about how principals uh, might develop a protocol for walking through schools and um, like medical rounds, only uh, instructional rounds, and how leaders can help uh, foster instructional improvement. 
Well, that, that's great. You can buy the book, and, or, you, or you can come to Harvard in the summer and do an executive education class with us, but that's expensive. But if, if, if Richard Elmore puts this course online, literally every principal in the world who speaks English could take a look at this. And so the dean of the School of Education could write to you and the other 15,000 superintendents and say, hey, this is available. Use this as professional development um, if you find it useful. So. I'm really excited about um, the potential to, for people to really share good ideas uh, across the globe in this world. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if I, I'm interested in pottery, right? There's no online course yet for new potters, but as soon as there is, you can bet that I'm going to be taking it because that's something that I'm interested in. And currently, I'm in YouTube trying to find, you know, good pottery demonstrations. It would be much better if some art instructor um, at any level, it wouldn't even have to be the high school level, developed something like that. And you know, there's one other thing that I, I thought I'd say about this. It, it's going to help lifelong learning. So I have a brother who's a math teacher, and he's already uh, flipped his classroom. He's using Khan Academy. He's already taken three online math courses. And he said to me, why don't we take Michael Sandel's course on justice together? Now, this is a, a, a philosophy course, basically, a moral reasoning course uh, offered by a professor at Harvard. Isn't that wild that one's brother might say, hey, let's do this together, <laughs> right? I mean, instead of book groups, we could actually have, I, I am quite certain we'll have online learning groups just the way that we have uh, book groups. And, and that will be all about online learning. I think that's really exciting for our for our nation and for the world. What is the role of the private sector as we think about educational reforms, educational programs that work in our state? Well, it's a, it's a profound question in so many respects. First of all, I don't think there's consensus in the community and certainly among the business community as to what the appropriate outcome is for our educational system. Uh, there was a recent article, I think, in Sunday's New York Times about the huge political debate in Texas that falls on political lines. But there's a group of people uh, who say that the purpose of higher education is for people to get jobs. And the focus should be on training, and students should know how much money they can make within 18 months of graduating, and that's what should direct them how to get to courses. So it's a very uh, utilitarian model of education as an economic driver. And there are, of course, a lot of businesses who feel that they want students graduating with higher competencies that they can take right into the workplace. And so there's a tremendous uh, sort of ambivalence and honest and good fight that we have to have about the goals of education. And the business community is going to be very important because at the end of the day, they have to help pay for it. There is a, a bit of a contradiction between those companies that say, universities, you're not producing skilled workers who have the hard and the soft skills to come to work. I have to go out of state to find them. Oh, and by the way, I refuse to pay any more taxes. So the business community is, is really the engine behind our economy. We have to serve them. They have to serve us. They have to be part of this discussion. And I don't think they have been in the way that's really important to moving forward. The best example is North Central High School with our biomedical program. And so we're partnering with the universities as well as a number of businesses to really work and make that successful with the equipment. We've had a number of donations. Um, that's been very, very helpful. Uh, one thing I'm starting, and uh, I'm going to start a business roundtable that meets with, with me, kind of my advisory board. It's not something we've had, because I do think business plays such an important role, but to have these very direct conversations. And so um, I'll have about eight individuals I'd like to keep on a two-year timeline. Um, one of them's here. I haven't. She doesn't know she's getting an invitation, but she's a bank president. But uh, <laughs> so, but I do think we need to have much, many more partnerships because you're right. The money that we're asking for is their money, and, and it's a partnership. And so, making sure I want them to look at how we are setting up our bonds and what we're asking for in our levies and bonds, and is it resonating with the community? So I do think we need to have many more honest conversations with business leaders, and invite them into our schools and to help us with internships. We have a very close relationship with the workforce development, with our career and technical education programs. And uh, the businesses in Spokane have been wonderful about internships, the hospital. We have a very good uh, partnership 
partnership with the Providence uh, medical system. Um, I can't say enough good things about our universities here in town, the community colleges, in terms of partnering with us and helping our students move forward. But we need to do more, much more. So I really want to continue to have those conversations on ways we can improve. Well, this is my final question, and then, um, Scott, I'm wondering if we might have just a couple of minutes to uh, let somebody from the audience ask a question or two. So I'm going to hand this over, uh, this microphone over to you in just a moment. Um, so uh, Kathy, in her, towards the end of her presentation, pointed to some alternative futures, which I took to mean basically, you know, here, here are some groups of other kinds of solutions that we might look at as well, coupled with the empirically driven, you know, research driven solutions that she pointed to. And I'm just curious to hear from each of you, including you, Kathy, which of those futures, you don't have to buy in wholesale to every single one of, every single component of, every, of, of each one, but which of those futures offers the, you know, the most promising uh, prospects for, for education? Just, just uh, for your uh, recognition, uh, the learning from abroad, or can, are there things that are, that are going on in other countries that we can steal from, uh, learn from? The more market-driven uh, kinds of solutions where dollars fo follow students? And then lastly, um, the uh, unbundling of schooling from schools, which I think is the most provocative of, of the three. So I'll let uh, one of you three, and I'd like to hear from all three, and then Kathy, I'll give you the last word. Nina? Uh, so I'll, I'll just address learning from abroad for a, a moment, because you mentioned Finland, and um, uh, several years ago, a delegation from Seattle went to Finland to look at the early learning system in Finland, and were pretty much blown away, um, because everybody gets uh, paid for high-quality uh, early learning in that state, and that's something, of course, that's not that's not the model that we use in, in the United States. And um, in fact, uh, one person talked to one of the teachers about uh, kids that have social, emotional, and behavioral problems. And what do, you, what do you do with those kids you know, when they can't make it in the early learning program? And the teacher says, what do you mean can't make it? We don't kick them out. You know, we keep them. We, we work with them until we get them to do what we need them to do. So very different approach. Um, and it's universal. Uh, and there are a lot of conversations happening in Washington right now about universal pre-K. Um, but we're late to the party. You know, it's, uh, there are other countries that have been doing this for a long time quite successfully, and uh, it, it pays huge dividends. You know, one thing that we're interested in in Spokane, and we've been pretty public about, is the whole idea of charter schools. And so we have applied to be a charter authorizer. I think the whole idea of more of an open market, uh, more options for parents, we actually have a committee of K-12 options uh, that has community members on it, um, teachers, parents, in terms of more choices and options. We do have a start with, we offer some Montessori programs, some magnet programs, some STEM with uh, North Central in particular. But I think just having more choices, whether it's an arts academy. I think charter, um, we've been doing a lot of research into KIPP. Um, we're looking at bringing a number of different charter offerings to the community to look at and have the community be a part of deciding which charters we would like to have, have come as be part of our offerings of schools in Spokane Public Schools. So we're really looking looking at Denver public schools right now. Uh, we see Denver as pretty similar to us in many, many ways. And so they're probably, though, about a decade ahead of where we're at. And so we know we have a lot of work to do, and we need to get moving on that. But I do think more options, more choices, that whole thing about everyone rises, all boats rise. Um, I do think we need to do that. We need to have more offerings. Jay. Well, my guess would be that if you took uh, polls of the American people and you showed them that we were really 15th or 25th, they would say either it can't be right or there's something fundamentally wrong with the picture. Either the populations are homogeneous and e too easy or, um, or they're, they, they sure they produce a lot of test results, but they're not creative like Americans are. I think that's denial. I think it's not true, but I think it's a pervasive attitude. I think we have a democratically based educational system that's very, very local. We have, I think, 264 uh, school districts in the state of Washington. Uh, Finland probably has fewer in the entire country, don't know. We are not about to give up local control. We are not about, I think, to have people say, I want to vest power 
in a higher bureaucracy. Um, I think going to a market system would be extraordinarily threatening to the existing school districts and school and educational institutions. We have a sense of rugged individualism and competition, and a lot of people are saying, I can make it work for my family. Now, what that misses is the whole group of people that are left behind, the 30% of even Washington students, ninth graders who don't graduate, and the increasing division within our state. But I have to say, as exciting and provocative those models are, they are very radical. And to get from where we are to there um, that sort of blows my mind. Well, I, I think I'm, I'm not going to choose one of the models, but I think what I'll focus on is something that cuts across some of the models, and that is the importance of effective teaching, because that's what touches children. That's what they experience. So I, I, I hope what we'll see in, in the future is um, better education and training of students, uh, of teachers rather, better professional development, and help with online learning. Because um, even with a challenged teacher education workforce, I, I think we could leverage that workforce with, a, with effective online learning. I'm a developmental psychologist, and um, so uh, I think everybody believes that um, it ha whatever you do, whatever kind of education you provide, it has to be developmentally appropriate. So you, you never do anything mechanical. I mean, you, with three-year-olds, you know, they're, they're, they learn through play, but you, you, know, you offer the appropriate kinds of activities and workstations so that um, learning is actually fun. You know, one of the things that I find interesting is um, there's a book about early childhood that the National Academies produced called Eager to Learn. And kids really are eager to learn. You, ju you just have to uh, provide them with the appropriate outlets for it. So that's very important. And I think you're, you are correct that if you, if you make um, preschool too regimented, you could really turn children off to education. So that's typically not a problem in early childhood, though, I have to say. I, I, don't, I, I think we have figured that one out, and, and that's a good thing. I, yeah, okay. I can respond if I could. I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a heavy political question, depending on what party you're on, or you know, whether it's war or peace. I think when we come to the realization that educational attainment for a much broader sector, a much broader swath of our population, is in all of our interests. It's better for the economy, uh, it's better for democracy, it lowers the costs of criminal justice system, it actually increases productivity. When we get to the point that we know it's in our best interest, we will mobilize to do it. And I'm afraid we're really not quite there yet regardless of the data. And things may have to get worse before we come to that realization and we're prepared to invest. When I was in the Tri-Cities as an administrator, Kennewick School District started a program called Get Ready for Kindergarten. I was extremely impressed with this program. It started at um, parenting programs. I actually, my, I had a young son or my child, so I got to, was able to go through the program. Um, but it's amazing. Even someone with an education background like myself, I didn't know everything from, for early preschool, what to do, what not to do, and the importance of certain things. So I think we think parents know more than they do, especially at very young ages. So I think programs like that, it was a birth to uh, age five, basically. Get ready for kindergarten, an amazing program. Kennewick uh, was able to see great gains in their reading scores, especially the number of students on grade level by third grade. And we all know that's a critical time, third grade reading. Our prisons are filled with individuals that read at third grade or below. So if that's really a critical time is that third grade. So I think programs like that, uh, parent um, education um, from every economic background will really benefit our community. So um, I would say that you put your finger on something really important when you talked about children not being able to sit still and focus. Um, and that is what we're seeing a lot with entering kindergartners. It's that whole social emotional development and being able to regulate their emotions, sit still, focus on the teacher at the front of the room. And there's some interesting things going on in our state now um, where we are actually developing 
curriculum to use in preschool uh, to help children begin to develop those skills. We call them executive functioning skills. Uh, but we are, we're doing some groundbreaking work and in fact we're selected by Harvard Center for the uh, Developing Child to be the first state to work with them on uh, working with children around developing this executive function. So um, you, you put your finger on it and I think there are some ways that we can uh, uh, attack that issue. I see your question really as a call for action, one I, I take really seriously, but there's, there's no easy way of getting there. I, I do think um, that, um, and you know because we talked a little bit earlier, I think Teach for America is a wonderful thing because um, we are interesting, interests young people in education as a possible career, we've kind of made education sexy again, which is a good thing. You know, we haven't really talked about this, but um, one of the things that the women's movement did was it created more career opportunities for people like me. And, and, and so the quality of the teacher workforce went down once women had more career opportunities. And that's what I mean by we need to make uh, the education sector as a career exciting again. And I, th I think one of the ways of doing that yeah, is to talk about it as a civil rights issue and, uh, and is to talk about it in the context of, of equity, is to talk about it in the context of the American dream because education is the only ticket right now to the, to the knowledge economy. Um, groups like Students for Education Reform, I mean, even though it's only in its third year, I think that's terrific because again, we're mobilizing a whole cohort of people to continue to care about this. So if they go off to be you know, doctors, lawyers, whatever, um, still within their community, they're going to do what they can um, to work for education equity. So thank you for your question. Well, this has been a great hour and a half. And would you all please join me in thanking our panelists for their wonderful contributions. Thank you. And would you also please join me in thanking Kathleen McCartney for her wonderful presentation and for her being here. Thank you. Just very quickly, uh, I want to also thank uh, the support of our sponsors, U.S. Bank, our title sponsor, and all the other organizations that have made this event possible. As Scott said, uh, next uh, fall in October, in fact, October 15th, uh, we are happy to uh, have Doris Kearns Goodwin, it's on the back of your program, uh, coming to Spokane. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, presidential uh, historian, and uh, scholar on Lincoln. Perhaps you are most familiar with her work, Team of Rivals, which was the basis for the award-winning movie that just recently came out, the Steven Spielberg movie, uh, Lincoln, that many of us saw. So I hope that you'll make plans now to uh, join us for breakfast on October 15th for Doris Kearns Goodwin. Until then, we wish you blessings. Thank you for being here. God bless. Thanks.